So when it comes to projections, we've already got the basic idea. We imagine that we have some line L, and we know that if there is a vector X that we want to project onto L, so let's say we have the vector X that looks like this, we'll call this X, and we want to project this onto L, then we know that the projection might look something like this. The projection is going to be on L, but it's the shadow of X. So maybe it looks right about like that, something like this. In other words, if we're shining a light from up here down onto X and onto L, the shadow that X creates on L, that's the projection of X onto L. And we write that as the projection of the vector X onto the line L. And we also know that we have this important piece here, which is the vector that's orthogonal to the projection. So it's at a 90 degree angle to the projection and it connects the projection vector to the original vector. And really, we know that that is just the vector x minus the projection vector. So minus the projection of x onto L. And of course, at this point, because we're talking about orthogonal complements, we want to say that if we call this projection vector, let's say we call it the vector v, and if we call this orthogonal vector here, let's call that w, then because we've been talking about these orthogonal complements, let's go ahead and say that the vector v is basically in the subset or the subspace L. So let's just say that v is in L. If that's the case, then w has to be a member of the orthogonal complement of L because w is perpendicular or orthogonal to v. So for the first time here, we have this idea of L as a subspace and L perp as a subspace, and we know that the vector V, which lies along L, is a member of the subspace L, and that means that W has to be a member of the subspace L perp, where L and L perp are orthogonal complements of each other. So with that idea in mind, we also want to realize that we can do this not just for lines like L. We can project a vector onto a subspace that's something other than just a one-dimensional line. For example, we might imagine three-dimensional space, so let's just think about this simply as three-dimensional space here, and let's say instead of the line L, maybe we have a plane. So we have some plane that looks kind of like this, and maybe it looks like this, and then we just have the plane here, and maybe we have some vector that looks like this, and we want to project it onto the plane. So let's go ahead and call the plane P. We'll call this vector X, and then we can say that the projection of X onto P might be a vector that looks like this. We can sketch it in a few different ways, but let's say maybe that it looks like that. It's the shadow of X on P. And so if we call that vector v, we could say v is the projection of the vector x onto p. And then, of course, we know that the orthogonal vector, this vector which is perpendicular or orthogonal to v, so maybe it looks like that, that we could again call that the vector w, and that's just equal to the vector x minus the projection of x onto p. And of course, in this case, we would say that v is part of the subspace p. So let's just say v is in p. If that's the case, then w is a member of the orthogonal complement of p, p perp, because w and v are orthogonal to each other. And in both of these cases, we want to remember as well that these projection vectors, so here the vector v and here the vector v, they are the closest vector to the original vector x that lie in the subspace. So if I'm thinking about the vector x as a projection onto the line L, and I want to find the vector in L that is as close as possible to the vector x, that's going to be the projection vector. And same thing here, this vector, the vector v, is going to be the closest vector that exists in P 
to the original vector x. So the point here is that we can project onto a line, we can project onto a plane, and we can project onto any other subspace. Here we have a one-dimensional subspace L, we have a two-dimensional subspace P, we could have a three-dimensional subspace. We could be projecting onto a three-dimensional subspace or a four-dimensional subspace. A subspace of any dimension, we can project the vector onto that subspace. And to do that, we actually have a formula that we can use to find that projection vector. So what we say is that if we have some subspace V, it's a subspace in Rn space. So let's just say V is in Rn space, V is defined in Rn space, then the projection of a vector x onto this subspace V is actually a linear transformation, which means we can write it as a matrix vector product, and that matrix vector product looks like this. We say the projection of any vector x onto the subspace V is given by, and now we have this complicated formula, which keep in mind that this complicated formula will actually get easier depending on how we define the subspace. So that's kind of a preview of what we're gonna be talking about later. But for now, in general, given any subspace, the formula is A times A transpose A inverse, and then A transpose times the vector X. So notice here that we said V was a linear transformation and it could be written as a matrix vector product. Well, what we realize here is that this whole thing before the vector x, these are all just matrices multiplied together. So this whole thing is going to simplify down into one single matrix. And so we're going to have this matrix and then the vector, this matrix vector product. And the matrix A is just going to be a matrix of the column vectors that form the basis for the subspace. So going back to these examples, if we were going to apply the formula, the matrix A would be a matrix of column vectors that form the basis for L, or a matrix of column vectors that form the basis for P, the line and the plane, the subspace that we're projecting onto. There are a couple important things we want to say before we go ahead and look at an example of how to apply this formula. The first is that in this formula, this inverse, this negative 1 inverse, we cannot distribute it across the A transpose A. So you can't say A transpose inverse and then separately multiplied by A inverse. You can't distribute this inverse across the A transpose A. The only time that's allowed is when the matrix A is a square invertible matrix. But if A is a square invertible matrix, then by definition, that means that A is just going to define all of Rn space. So for example, let's say that V is in R3. That means A is going to define all of R3. But if we just project a vector x that's in R3 onto R3, we're already saying that V is all of Rn space. So the projection of a three-dimensional vector in R3, when V is all of R3, the projection of x is just going to be x itself because x already exists in that space. So it doesn't really do anything for us to say that the projection of x is x itself. There is no other projection, there's no shadow, it's just the vector x itself. So there's really no point in using this formula when that's the case. The only time we're going to use this formula is when the matrix A is not square or not invertible, and when that's the case, we cannot distribute this negative 1 across the A transpose A. So we have to find A transpose A first, and then find the inverse to simplify this whole thing here. So given that, let's do an example. Let's say that we're given some subspace V, and let's say that V is a plane in R3, like this example down here. So V might be the span of, let's say, first the vector 2, 1, 1, and then the vector, let's say, 1, 0, negative 1. We're going to say that X is a vector in R3, and we want to find the projection of x onto this subspace v. So it looks exactly like what we have down here. We have these two vectors which are defining a plane in R3, and x is going to be projected onto that plane in R3. We want to find an expression for the projection of any x onto this subspace. So first, we say that this matrix A that's made up of the column vectors that form the basis for v is just going to be the two column vectors we were given. So 2, 1, 1, 
1, 0, negative 1, then we also know that a transpose is going to be 2, 1, 1, 0, 1, negative 1. And so now we're going to start chipping away at this formula. The first thing we want to find is a transpose a, so we can simplify this value inside the parentheses. So a transpose a is going to be equal to, we have here 2, 1, 1, 1, 0, negative 1 for a transpose, multiplied by a, which is 2, 1, 1, 0, 1, negative 1. So when we find this product, we'll get here 2 times 2 is 4, 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1, and then 2 times 1 is 2, 1 times 0 is 0, and 1 times a negative 1 is a negative 1. 1 times 2 is 2, 0 times 1 is 0, negative 1 times 1 is a negative 1, and then 1 times 1 is 1, 0 times 0 is 0, negative 1 times a negative 1 is a positive 1. So a transpose a is going to be 6, 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, and 2. So 6, 1, 1, 2. And now we need to go ahead and find the inverse of a transpose a so that we can plug it in here for this value. So let's say that we'll use this method where we augment with the identity matrix. So 1, 2, we'll augment with 1, 0, 0, 1. And we need to put this left-hand side into reduced row echelon form. So let's go ahead and flip the rows, swap the rows. So 1, 2, 0, 1, 6, 1, 1, 0. And then let's go ahead and subtract 6 of the first row from the second row. So the first row will stay the same. And the second row will take 6 minus 6 times 1 is 0. 1 minus 6 times 2 is 1 minus 12, or negative 11. 1 minus 6 times 0 is 1. 0 minus 6 times 1 is a negative 6. Then we'll multiply through the second row by negative 1 over 11. So the first row will stay the same, 0, 1. And then we'll get 0, positive 1, negative 1 over 11, and then positive 6 over 11. And then we'll go ahead and subtract 2 of the second row from the first row. So our second row will stay the same, 0, 1 and then negative 1 over 11, 6 over 11. But the first row will say 1 minus 2 times 0 is 1, 2 minus 2 times 1 is 0, 0 minus 2 times negative 1 over 11 is 0 minus negative 2 elevenths, or 0 plus 2 elevenths, that's positive 2 over 11. And then 1 minus 2 times 6 elevenths is 1 minus 12 over 11, and that's a negative 1 over 11. So now if we make some room by getting rid of this, which we no longer need, and all of this, all we're left with here is a, a transpose, and then over here we're going to have the inverse. This is a transpose a inverse. This right-hand side is this value right here. So if we plug everything into this projection formula, what we get here is a, so we have 2, 1, 1, 1, 0, negative 1, multiplied by a transpose a inverse, that's this matrix on the right that we found, so that is 2 over 11, negative 1 over 11, negative 1 over 11, and 6 over 11, and then a transpose, which we found here, 2, 1, 1, 1, 0, negative 1. So all we have left to do is simplify this matrix. Let's go ahead and work on the first two matrices first. So we'll say 2 times 2 over 11, that's 4 over 11, plus 1 times negative 1 over 11, that's just a negative 1 over 11. And then here, 2 times negative 1 over 11, that's negative 2 over 11, and 1 times 6 over 11 is 6 elevenths. Then we go to our second row, we get 1 times 2 over 11, and then 0 times negative 1 over 11, so plus 0. Here we get 1 is a negative 1 over 11 and 0. And then working on the third row here, we get 2 over 11, and then minus a negative is going to be plus 1 over 11. And then here we get a minus 1 over 11 and a minus 6 over 11. So when we simplify here, We'll keep this second matrix 2, 1, 1, 1, 0, negative 1. 
When we simplify this first matrix, we'll end up with 3 over 11, and then negative 2 plus 6 is a positive 4, so 4 over 11, we get 2 over 11, negative 1 over 11, 3 over 11, and then negative 7 over 11. And then we have that multiplied by 2, 1, 1, 1, 0, negative 1. The result then of this multiplication is going to be a 3 by 3 matrix. So we'll say 3 over 11 times 2 is 6 over 11, plus 4 over 11 times 1, so plus 4 over 11. Then we've got the first row by the second column, so that's 3 over 11 plus 0. Then we have the first row times the third column, that's 3 over 11 minus 4 over 11. Then we work on the second row here. Second row times the first column is 4 over 11 minus 1 over 11, and then 2 over 11 minus 0, and then 2 over 11 plus 1 over 11. Then we'll work on the third row. So the third row times the first column will be 6 over 11 minus 7 over 11, and then the third row times the second column, 3 over 11 minus 0. And then the third row times the third column will be 3 over 11 plus 7 over 11. And when we simplify, we'll get our final matrix here. So 10 over 11, 3 over 11, and then negative 1 over 11. Here we'll get 3 over 11, 2 over 11, 3, negative 1, 3, and 10. And so we could leave the matrix like this, and we could say that the projection of any x onto this particular subspace V, remember this is a plane in R3, it looks like this, we've got some plane in R3, and what we found here is a matrix where if we want to project any x at all, onto the plane given by this set V, then all we have to do is take this matrix and multiply it by the vector X. And that's why this is so useful because we have this generic projection matrix, which we can use. So regardless of which X value we pick, we could pick any X vector at all that we want. We just have to multiply this projection matrix by the vector X that we choose in order to find the projection of that particular X into the plane that was given as V up here. We could also, a lot of times you'll end up with fractions like these. We could simplify this by pulling out the one over 11. So we could pull out the one over 11 for our final answer and then just say 10, three, negative one, three, two, three, negative one, three, and 10, once we have the final answer. And then you could multiply that value the projection matrix and the 1 over 11 scalar by the vector x, and you could express the final answer that way. But that's what this formula boils down to, is it gives you this projection matrix that you can use to find the projection of any vector x that you choose to project onto the subspace.